Hello, and welcome to Subversive Radio. I'm your host, of course, Keith Giles. No one here but me. And uh, we are continuing our ongoing podcast series, House Church 101. I'm going to talk about the epic, important, all-powerful topic of leadership. Um, The whole topic of leadership is actually one of these things that... um, I probably will do one of these days soon an entire podcast just on leadership mania in the Christian church in general because it's kind of one of my pet peeves um, about the overemphasis that is quite often given to this topic of leadership in the church today, Um, but not right now. Uh, For this podcast, I want to talk specifically about what leadership looks like in the organic church or open meeting context. So if you've been following along at all so far, um, you've noticed I've been describing for you a meeting that is very much, um, well, it's just very different from what most church uh, experiences have been for most of us who've grown up in westernized, traditional, institutional forms of church. So... um, Because of that, that's why I wanted to devote an entire podcast on this topic of leadership, because leadership as we know it usually involves sort of a CEO-style, you know, single person at the front of the room who does most of the talking, all of the teaching, who does all the sacraments, all the baptizing, all the marrying, all the communion, um, all the discipling, um... All, makes all the dis- important decisions for the people in the church and what we'll do next and what we'll do next month and what are, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, everything kind of flows and runs. All ministry runs and moves through this single pastor. And that really is not something that works in the organic church model. The Again, the organic church model is the only head is Jesus. The rest of us are all brothers and sisters, and when we come together, our goal is to work together to allow Jesus in our midst to be our head and our leader, and that we want him to be the one doing it. So let's talk a little bit about what then leadership would look like in this New Testament context. It's also very difficult. I'm not going to, I don't want to get bogged down on definitions and stuff, but it is really challenging to have this conversation without making sure, kind of like making sure we define all of our terms. So, I mean, I even hate using the word leadership because honestly, when I say the word leadership today, um, especially in Christian circles, most people picture that CEO style pastor leader in the front of the room who does everything. And so I hesitate to even use that word because it's difficult to discuss it in a New Testament organic church context without, you know, maybe unintentionally creating some pictures in your mind. Uh, and the same can be said for even the word pastor. I mean, the words pastor and the words leadership are in the New Testament, but not at all anywhere close to what we see and experience and practice in most churches today. So um, just understand that when I use the word leadership, and you'll get it as I go along, I, I intend something very different than what we have known in the past. So a leader, quote-unquote leader, in an organic church context if he's not the guy up front, if he's not the guy doing all the talking, if he's not the one setting the agenda, then, you know, what is he doing? So really, most of what I do in our house church family on a regular basis is um, mostly de- mostly defined by what I don't do. Really, it is, a, it is an exercise in restraint and self-control. Um, and so... What I don't do, I'm going to talk about what I don't do first, and then we'll get into the things you can do and what you, you know, the positive things, the actions that you can take. But I, what I don't do is I don't schedule everything in advance. I don't create any kind of order of service. I don't decide in advance we're going to talk about this today or next Sunday we're going to talk about that or, you know, I don't create an order of service. I don't, um, um, I make sure actually what I want to do is the actual opposite. I want to create the feeling that when everyone comes together that no one knows what exactly is going to happen. And that keeps us in an attitude of anticipation that, that Jesus might want to do something amazing and different than what we experienced in the last week or the week before. 
So you wouldn't schedule some things. You wouldn't create an order of service. You wouldn't pick all the worship songs ahead of time. You wouldn't pick the topic for discussions. Uh, you wouldn't drive the conversation in a certain direction. Um, you, again, you wouldn't do all the teaching or the talking. You might not even talk at all. You might not even share at all if God hasn't given you something to share. You wouldn't try to control everything. And you wouldn't try to fill all the awkward silences uh, in between individual people sharing. You know, you wouldn't want to jump in to say something just to keep the ball rolling. If you felt like it was losing momentum, again, that isn't your job. Now, you may feel that it is, and early on, those are things you probably are going to have to fight yourself because you're going to want to do that. And some people are even going to kind of give you a look once in a while and, and look at you as if that is what you should do. I know one of the things that you shouldn't do and the things that it took me a while to learn in my experience was don't don't answer all the questions because uh, in my experience, you know, I was the only licensed and ordained, you know, pastor slash former pastor in the room when we started our house church family about seven years ago. And um, and so anytime anybody had any kind of a question about a, a verse of scripture, they would read a scripture or they would have a question they, and then they would ask their question. Then everyone would just look at me. Sometimes they didn't even ask me directly. They would just, you know, the question would be asked and then they would look at me. And, and, and I'll admit, I, in the first couple of years we were together, I answered those questions. I really did. But then slowly the Holy Spirit started to prompt me and nudge me and kind of rebuke me and tell me to cut that out. Don't do that. So um, I can remember clearly, you know, one, one Sunday one of the ladies asked a question and I, I knew the answer, at least I knew an answer. Uh, I, I, ha I had a response ready, but I really felt the Holy Spirit say, don't answer it. And so I just leaned back and I said, you know, what do you guys think? And it was beautiful because it was like a moment. It was a, really a watershed moment for our group because it, the, we turned a corner there because then all the attention went off of me. And then suddenly everyone remembered, oh, yeah, I've got a Bible in front of me here. Uh, yeah, I read the Bible. You know, I've, I think I've heard this brought up in the past. Uh, you know, and then they began to look at different scriptures and they, they began to, you know, really as the body of Christ, they just sort of discussed it. And, and, and looked at the looked at the scriptures together and doggone it if they didn't arrive at the same response that I was going to give them anyway. And it took a little bit longer, but it was worth it because by the time we as a body had arrived at the answer to that question, we had all worked it out. We had all discovered together what that passage was saying and then we as a group, we owned it. You know, we... Um, we worked together to kind of mine that gold out of the ground. And now that was our little nugget. You know, that was something we held on to. That was an important lesson. So as my friend Neil Cole has so famously said, your job in an organic church setting is to be the Bible question man, not the Bible answer man. And, you know, it's one of the things I love about Jesus. He's so good at this. I'm so bad at it, but he's so good at it. And I want to get better at it. But Jesus is so great at asking great questions. And even when people ask him questions, you know, if you notice in the New Testament, I think Jesus was asked maybe 20, 30 questions, and he only answered one or two. Um, most of the time he responded by asking another question. And so Jesus was very comfortable with questions, and, and he understood the power of a question to really unlock the kingdom for people. He understood that principle, like I just described, that if you dig out the answer yourself, it's yours. You own it. And you don't lose it. You don't forget it. And then if someone asks that question later on, you're, you're eager to say, you know, I think I know the answer to that question. So um, what you can do is be the Bible question man. Learn to ask good questions and learn to let the people in the body um, work things out for themselves. Um, one thing, one major thing you could do, actually I would probably should have put this at the top of the list, you can pray. Uh, I can tell you what, an open meeting like this requires more prayer, not less. Um, not just by you, but by everyone else in the body, and certainly by those you would consider in eldership or leadership uh, in, in the body. Um, praying together, coming together in prayer, and constantly confessing your weakness to God, asking him for his help, asking him to show up, um, declaring 
and confessing that you need God and, and you know, that without him you can do nothing. So spend a lot of time in prayer and praying for one another, praying for the people in your church family. And, and I mean that you should pray privately during the week and you should also pray um, before the meeting begins. If you can get together an hour or so before the meeting to do that or certainly before you begin uh, your open time together. You can also learn how to um, rein in those who talk too much. And you can learn how to draw out the wallflowers who sort of typically sit quietly and hope that no one notices them. And that's important because, again, the goal of an organic open meeting, the goal is that everyone have an opportunity to share, to speak, to use their gift, to bring something that edifies the body of Christ, as it says in 1 Corinthians 14. You know, what shall we say then, brothers and sisters, when you come together, uh, each of you has a word, a hymn, a tongue, a word of instruction, a revelation, etc. And so, the, however, the tendency is that that doesn't happen naturally, because in every group, there's one or two people, inevitably, who do all of the talking and are more than happy to just talk the entire two, three, four hours you're together. They will just talk the whole time and love every second of it. And um, and not that they're not sharing things that are important, but the fact that they're taking up all the time um, and that they're so eager to do it means that those who are a little more timid and a little more reticent, um, you know, will just be happy to let that person go on and on. So as, an, as, a, uh, as a leader in an open church meeting, uh, one thing you can do is to, to learn when someone has kind of said their piece and say, you know, brother, hang on a minute. I think there are a few other people we haven't heard from. Uh, so hang on to that. Maybe we'll come back to that in a second. But is there someone who, hasn't, who we haven't heard from who, who would, has something to share? Sometimes you need to call those people by name. You need to say, you know, hey, Sister Mary, or hey, you know, Brother James, um, we haven't heard from you <clears throat> today. Uh, is there something on your heart? Is there something you'd like to share? It's actually better, by the way, that while the person who does all the talking all the time is in that mode of talking, um, look around the room and look at the faces of the people around you. And I, and as the Lord even show you, um, who should I call on when it comes that time? Um, when it comes time to call on someone who hasn't spoken in a while or someone who might have something to share. you know, And a lot, often the Lord will show you someone that you can kind of see from their face, from their body language. Maybe the Lord just uh, reveals it to you. You know, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, they've got something that they're considering to share and you should encourage them to share it. So that's one of the things you can do. And the other thing is to keep things positive and encouraging and edifying. So quite often in groups like this... Um, People like to bring their gripes, and so they want to gripe about their work or their boss or their neighbor or other Christians or things like that, and and I would cut that person off quickly. I wouldn't even let them finish their first sentence if you realize that that's where they're going to go, because we want to keep, we want to guard uh, and keep precious that edifying sharing time, that time near the beginning where the goal is that we come together in prayer, we're seeking Jesus to be our head and our Lord, we're wanting everyone to have an opportunity to share, we're wanting everyone to bring something that edifies and encourages the body. So the things that we bring should be edifying and encouraging us in our individual walk with Jesus. So these are things like testimonies. These are things like, you know, verses of Scripture that bless people, that encourage people. Uh, People sharing, you know, God spoke to me this week as I was in my quiet time or as I was praying or as I was driving my car or as I was reading this verse of scripture or whatever it may be and God just blessed my heart with this and I want to bring it to you my brothers and sisters as a blessing to you I hope it blesses you as much as it blesses me and we want to keep that time for that purpose now there is a time for people to share concerns and prayer requests and things that are bugging them and bothering them and things they want help with and things they want God to help them with and so, just as an example, this is how I typically handle that kind of thing. I will usually cut that person off if I re- get that they're just wanting to gripe, and they're doing it during that, you know, that important time where we're trying to focus on edifying. And I'll say, you know, hey, brother so-and-so, you know what, I, I totally hear what you're saying. Could we, could we move that uh, and save that? I mean, 
I validate what you're saying, and it's important, and we definitely want to hear about that, and we definitely want to pray for you about that. But can we can we finish that um, near the end of the meeting? And because again, remind them we want to keep this as a time that everything people are is sharing are sharing during this time is encouraging and edifying to the body. Okay, and usually, I mean, I've never had a problem with it. You can keep going, and and there's a way to do it without hurting people's feelings. It's just uh, a positive reminder to people. Hey, remember, this is what we're doing. That's what this time is for. And there's another time for that. Well, let's do that at another time. Another thing I would, I think you can do, this is also very important. Uh, excuse me for that long pause. I was taking a sip of tea. I'm going to do it again. Okay. Um, here's what you should do. Um, again, another thing you'll notice when people first come into this open church organic church model, and they, as they really start to get it, they typically will go through a sort of a, um, what we call a detox phase, where they just need some time to vent and to let it out and to kind of just say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I used to be part of something like that, and I can't believe that, um, you know, but but it's, it's usually a lot more about the negative of I can't believe, you know, that people meet in this, in a way that isn't organic, more so than it's a positive thing of, man, this blesses me so much. I get so much out of this. Praise God for this. I am so thankful for you people and blah, blah, blah. It's usually very negative. And so, uh, and, or sometimes it's a gripe against other churches. And what I mean, it, it's like this. And again, these are just examples from my own experience where someone may, um, during that share time, start sharing things like, you know, these people over here at this other church, the way they do evangelism, you know, they just throw they throw scriptures at people, or they they hold signs on the street corner, or they pass out chick tracks at the mall, or whatever. And we kind of like make fun of them or mock them or whatever. And so, and that's just an example, but it could be anything. It could be, you know, I don't like the way these people, um, or these these Christians over here. Um, I don't like they do the way I don't th- I think the way they do their youth group is wrong, or I think the way they evangelize is wrong, or they think the way they do whatever is wrong. And here's a great thing you can do as a facilitator, as a as a leader in an open church meeting. When someone starts to complain about that, so let's say they are making fun of uh, or complaining about the way this church over here uh, is doing evangelism wrong, is to say to them, you know, <clears throat> I hear what you're saying, brother. But here's my question. Let's let's do a little um let's do a temperature check here uh in our group here because we're a church. And how is our church doing in that area of evangelism? Has anyone here been sharing Jesus at work lately? See, quickly and immediately turn it around to what are we doing right now? So instead of pointing the finger and mocking and and making fun of how people over there are doing it wrong or not doing it the right way and and we know the right way, See, that becomes a conversation in an abstract way about those people over there. But the point of the organic church gathering is really to center on us as disciples. How are we following Jesus? And that's one thing to keep in mind as a leader in this kind of a context. Don't let people, don't allow people to make themselves feel better about themselves by making fun of others, by putting other people down. Bring it back around to, guys, how are we doing in this area? How many people have come to Christ in our group? How many baptisms have we had? Um, so, yeah, that may be the wrong way to do it, but how, how is it that we are doing it the right way right now? So bring it back to the practical. Bring it back to the personal. Um, continue. That, could, that should be your job. I mean, that should be your mission, is to keep the conversation on what Jesus is doing in your life uh, and in your church family, you know, in the here and now. Um, Here's another thing. I'm going to use this as an example. Um, My good friend, Herb Montgomery, who I just interviewed a couple days ago, and it's a great interview, by the way. It's it's on YouTube, and you can can go to my blog at keithchiles.com and listen to it. Um, it, But the story I'm going to tell you isn't from that interview, so... But anyway, you can listen to some other great stuff in that interview. But uh, before that, he and I were talking, and he he has these heart groups, which are small, open-style meeting groups that he's he's trying to inspire and start around the country. And um, he was telling me about this one group that 
uh, a friend of his was trying to inspire and kind of coach this guy from a distance. And um, so he's not there. He's in another state. And But this guy's starting one of these, you know, trying to lead one of these groups. So he tells everybody, that this leader tells everybody, hey, we're going to get together and I want everyone during the week to think about what to bring and to bring something, you know, bring something to share so everyone has something to share because this is an open participatory meeting. Um, and so they did that. So after that first meeting, my Herb called the guy and said, hey, how did it go? And the guy goes, oh, man, it was a train wreck. It was just, oh, this is so painful. It was horrible. So Herb's like, wow, man, what happened? So here's what happened. Um, everybody th- who brought something to share, they, you know, they brought something to share about uh, either, yeah, my favorite radio show, you know, is so-and-so. And on this radio show today, he was talking about these people that do this and th- this is wrong and that blah, blah, blah. And then the next guy shared something from his favorite Christian author. And it was like, yeah, I'm going to read this to you. But it was, you know, so every, but everything everybody was bringing was really more, um, it was more about, again, sort of complaining about other people or uh, polarized doctrinal theological issues uh, or political issues. And um, and so it just ended up being this big, huge disagreement, argument. It was a huge fight, basically. And uh, he was like, man, I can't do this. This isn't going to work. And so let me just tell you what I, what I would tell you, what I would tell someone like that who is experiencing that kind of a thing in their open church meeting. Here is what your job is. Here's what you should do. What you should say to your group in that situation is, okay, guys, listen, thank you for trying this, but let me just remind you, let me just refine what I'm asking you to do. Now, this coming week, what I want you to do is pray about and pray seriously every day and say, Jesus, what is it you would want me to bring? And then listen to what God speaks to you. And the kinds of things that I want you to be thinking about to bring, to share— Think about what blessing, what encouragement I can bring as a gift to everyone else here. In other words, what I'm bringing isn't for me. It's for someone else here in the body. And and it should be something like a scripture verse that God speaks to you, that speaks to you personally and really blesses you. But you think, you know, this would also bless others. I think this would be encouraging to others. Um, It can be a testimony. Let's say you don't have a testimony that's immediate from this very week or last week. But, you know, there was a time in your life when you were a young person that God did answer an amazing prayer or he worked a miracle or God did something awesome and he spoke to you in in a powerful way. You know what? Bring that because that is such a beautiful testimony and an amazing story. Bring something like that or bring your favorite psalm and tell us why it's it's your favorite and then read it to us and then tell us how it blesses you and then ask others how it blesses them or something like that. So I would give them more specific direction um, of the kinds of things you're looking for and the kinds of things you're not looking for. Say, you know, I don't want you to bring things like this. See, did you notice how we kind of argued about these issues and these topics and these, these, you know, opinions? Please don't bring your opinions. Please don't bring your, um, you know, things that, that cause division. We're looking to bring things that encourage and edify and bless one another. That's what you should do. And your job then is to every week just keep reminding them of that and keep pointing out to them. If someone brings something that's exactly what you're talking about, say that. Oh, sister so-and-so, thank you. That is exactly what we needed to hear. That was beautiful. And if someone brings something again and they're just they're not getting it and they keep bringing something that's negative or whatever... You know, then you say, you know, well, you know, then either you need to say to them, hey, oh, hang on a minute. Can we, can we pause here? Can we, can you share that later on at near the end of the meeting? That's cool. But can we talk about that later? Because again, what we want to do is protect this, this uh, opening time, this beginning time, this central time that we have together as something, again, that encourages and edifies and blesses everyone else in the room. And that is one of the most important things you can do. Uh, as as a quote unquote leader um, in an open church meeting, and again, I keep saying quote unquote leader because like as I said at the beginning, these terms these terminologies can get confusing so again when you when you read the New Testament, yes, the word leadership is there. leadership is a gift that God does give to the body of Christ, so again, we're not talking about anarchy, there is leadership in the body of Christ in an open meeting. The difference is, is that our only authority and head is Christ. 
and the kind of leadership that comes from one another, from other people in the body, is um, it's gentle, it's encouraging, um, and it's uh, it's sort of, sort of goal oriented. In other words, with your eye on the goal of encouraging and edifying others in the body, with an eye on the goal of allowing Jesus to be the head and not letting anyone else take control, not letting anyone else take the reins and run off the rails with anything or take you off in the weeds in somewhere you don't need to be, but gently always drawing everyone back uh, to that. And really, the more the group begins to understand that and they begin to get that, the less you'll ever have to say anything uh, to correct someone or to remind someone or to... Um, you know, to to kind of rein in the one that talks too much or draw out the one that doesn't share as often because then they'll begin to equalize a little bit. People will get begin to get it. You know, the one who talks too much will begin to understand, yeah, I probably should only share one or two things and then uh, I should be the one looking around the room to say, does anyone else have anything, something to share? Um, and th- those who get called out a little more often will start to realize, you know, it's okay for me to talk. Um this is a safe place. That, and that's your other job as well, is to make sure that it is a safe place. Another thing you may need to do is if you, re- you realize that someone in, the, in, in your body, in your, this fellowship that you're part of, if you realize that someone has something against another person, encourage that person to go to them and apologize or to make it right, because that's biblical and, and scriptural. Don't allow, if you are aware that there are something, something between them, don't allow that wedge to be built. But in, encourage them immediately and quickly. Go to both parties and encourage both of them to go to the other privately and to work it out. Um, that's another thing you can do that's very important to do, to keep the peace in the body of Christ. But again, these shouldn't be things that you're alone in. Um, I really firmly believe that there are elders and quote-unquote pastors, plural, in every body, unless you have a very ex- extremely small body of believers and unless only one person is... Um, has been a Christian for a long period of time and everybody else in the room is, is a brand new baby Christian, which again, that can happen. You can't have a group of mostly brand new Christians and only one or two uh, people who've been Christians for a longer period of time. Um, in our group, we're mostly people that have been Christians for a long period of time. And so we have several people that I would consider our elders, probably mo- more elders than, than not. Um, and so we all share in a lot of that work, you know, and in other words, not again, no one is looking to me specifically to do everything I just described. Um, I would only need to step up and speak up and do that if if someone else didn't do it first. But quite often other people would be quick to say, you know, hang on, brother, I don't think that person was finished. Or, you know, sister, that was that was really cool, but um you know, can maybe maybe we can move on to something else. So, you know, those are the those are the kind of things where it helps to have a bigger group of, of uh, elders and, and people in the, in the church body who get it. But if you're the only one, then I guess you have to do that, and that's your job. But your goal also should be to begin um, encouraging everyone to do what I just said. In other words, don't, don't hang on to those, things, to, those, uh, to those things I just described as if that's your job and only your job and no one else gets to do that. Don't do that. Uh, give it away, share it, encourage others to do it. Uh, because again, there may be times you're not even in the room. Maybe you won't even be there that time that they come together. And and the body needs to be able to function without you in the room. Uh, that's a good test, by the way, a good litmus test. If, the, if your church fellowship can't meet and function because you're not there, if you're on vacation and they just decide to wait till you get back, um, it's a good opportunity to ask, whose church is this? Is it is it your church or is it Jesus' church? Because if it's Jesus' church, he doesn't need your help to run it. He shouldn't. Uh, well, he doesn't, unless you have kind of taken on way too much of that control for yourself. So give it away. I encourage you to do that. And unfortunately, we're out of time for this um, podcast, but thank you for listening, and we will talk again. All right? Uh, have a great evening, and let the kingdom come. God bless.